I'm looking at Mahalo. He's learned how to, he's using his body more. And so he's doing this often. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I can hear him in the background. <laughs> oh, you can't? Uh-oh. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit sometimes. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to say something about that. You know, this is real life, y'all. This is real life. I think we can have some disclaimers. Do you want to start with yeah. the baby disclaimer? Okay. <laughs> That sounds awful. <laughs> Baby disclaimer, the phrase. Let's say the, um, I don't know what else to call it. Well, the I mean, I just, I'll just say. Warning. <laughs> warning. You will hear a child in the background. So, yes. Um, uh, recently, uh, about eight months ago, I gave birth to a baby. <laughs> So just so you know, everyone listening or watching me right now, he's in the background and this is real life. This is mom's working. This is called labor. Okay. Labor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for joining us on Reflect Recalibrate. Woo -woo. <laughs> We're so happy you're here. Remember to tell your friends, your family, and your foes yes, your foes, that they too can learn about artivists and artivism by subscribing to RFC anywhere they listen to podcasts. They can also watch and subscribe on YouTube at Reflect Calibrate the Podcast. Well, I think that's that. Now let's get into it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then let's say disclaimer number two, there is some noise in the background of Gabrielle's video as well. Mm -hmm. yes. And they explain why there's that noise. And it's actually an important part of the story today. So recently we interviewed Gabrielle Torres, who goes by they, them. And I loved this interview. I don't know about yes. you, Janet, but this, this hit a lot of personal stuff for me. Yes, I think that Gabrielle was very open with us. Uh, talk about candor. I think if there were some key words that we would want to share uh, about this episode, the two that I would choose that come to my mind first and foremost are trauma and resilience. Yeah. How about you, Danny? Yeah. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna combine my two words. I'm going to actually say safe space, which I know is like mm -hmm. such a overly used phrase. And a lot of people even make fun of it. I, th I saw a South Park episode recently that made fun of it, <laughs> but like, oh I do gosh. think it's an important phrase. And I think we, we explore in many different ways in this episode of what is a safe space for artists and artists of different backgrounds. I won't say anymore. We'll just, right. we'll just let the episode speak for itself, but yeah. So this is the part of the, the conversation where Janet has to give disclaimer number three, which is that she effed up the gallery mode recording <laughs> <laughs> and the low quality me. recording. Uh, it no, was not it was Janet. The Zoom. It was the Zoom people, okay? People. They do these automatic updates and then they change <laughs> your settings. But see, this is a lesson in preparation. If I had just you know, just, just because just let me just run through my settings that I have already set up and that were working <laughs> fine, but I did not. So you'll have to just stare at visual faces throughout this conversation. Mm -hmm. If you're watching, it's a good thing. But we're I, all beautiful. Even when we're not in high def, <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. Actually, we might be more beautiful when we're not in high def. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. We don't need these things to enhance our beauty. Okay. We don't need it. All right. Let's go. Welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you for being here today. How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. Good. It's another day. <laughs> it's another day. Yeah. It's another day, another moment. Can you expound a little bit about where you are? Describe also maybe what you're wearing and maybe what did you have for breakfast today? We can start with that and go from there. <laughs> cool. um, I am a white looking man with a beard wearing a black hoodie with a white background. Um, geographically, I am currently in the mountains of uh, Antioquia in Colombia, in a place called Copacabana, in a rehab facility. I had for breakfast an arepa with peanut butter, a really big loaf of bread, rice, 
eggs and something called agua, agua de panela, which is sugar condensed into these squares like the, the indigenous people make. And then you take it, you grind it and you uh, put it inside of water and it just turns into this soft drink that Colombians all have every morning. Wow. So like all, all Colombians, that's not specific to the rehab facility? No, no, no. This is okay. this something that like my grandma used to make. Um, oh, wow. and we, put, we have like this weird thing in Colombia where I know that both of you are going to be like, what is that? Because I've seen <laughs> reactions before, but we put mozzarella cheese inside of hot chocolate. Uh, <laughs> I knew that this was going to happen. <laughs> Yeah, we both are on mute right now because we're trying not to interrupt you, but we're both laughing. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And we also put it inside of that drink because it's, it's like the, the, the cheese melts at the bottom of the hot chocolate and gives this, this chocolate like this thickness. But then you take the cheese out and it has all of the chocolate surrounding it. Wow, we're going to learn all sorts of things today, Janet. Yeah, and, and actually, that doesn't sound bad. I mean, you know, anything with chocolate, is, you know, I just, come on, it's, it's just going to be good anyway, so. <laughs> I am a dark-skinned woman. Uh, I have, or I'm wearing large green square glasses. Uh, I have honey blonde, very short, close to um, my scalp uh, haircut afro and I have on a netted cream shirt uh, and some large uh, circular earrings that have your logo on it no that, that have my logo a an afro yeah. butterfly an afro yeah. butterfly <laughs> yeah so I am a light-skinned woman and I'm a cisgender woman and I am in my studio office. So behind me, there's a bunch of art on the wall. I have brown blondish hair and these big, big headphones that make me feel like Princess Leia when I wear them. And I have big silver hoop earrings. <laughs> and then we are with Gabriel. And Gabriel, can you tell us a little bit about who you are? What kind of work that you do? I am a person from Colombia. I really like to start by saying that because it's a big part of what I do and, and what I believe in. Um, I am an artist. Uh, I'm also a community engagement coordinator, catalyst, um, and an educator. And my work dwells in the intersections between different technologies and devices utilized for expression, um, as well as community organizing. That was very, there's so much that you do. That was very succinct. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I have a hard time with that as an artist. There's a lot of different things. Yeah. Getting a little used to having to condense. Right. Right. Yeah. That's a whole, and that could be a whole episode for us too, of, the, of how artists brand themselves, especially interdisciplinary artists. That's a whole, a whole thing. Exactly. In itself. Exactly. Yeah. When you're a polymath, polymath, polymath. Yeah. Janet, can we jump into talking about House of Dust since we're talking about the work? Yeah. Yeah. I, just just from what you described as what you do, Gabrielle, I definitely want to go into House of Dust. Describe to our audience what House of Dust is. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, one second. Vale. ¿Puedes asegurarte que la puerta está cerrada? Gracias. I'm just making sure because they have loud music. Today is privilege day for mm -hmm. people here, which means that everybody just gets to be cool and have fun. Because uh, it's a uh, it's a holiday in Colombia. Oh, what which, what holiday? Which holiday? Is today? Yeah, I have no idea because Colombia oh. has like, <laughs> Colombia has like sixty seven <laughs> holidays. Like last Monday was a holiday. Next Monday <laughs> is a holiday. <laughs> so wow. Okay, so I'm okay. we can talk later about the other reasons you moved to Colombia, but that's a great start. <laughs> so um, House of Dust is a multi-layer campaign, um, and it's to bring awareness about substance abuse uh, in the Latinx queer community. That's the brand of the project. I think as he has been expanding and growing, um, I've started to realize that more than just thinking about my community, the community that I'm part as a Latinx queer person. Uh, it's about destigmatizing substance abuse and destigmatizing substance use inside of society at large. 
Um, it has three different elements. One of them, it's a media installation uh, that starts with a, a world, a fictional world, uh, and it leads into talking documentary based about my own story, utilizing myself. Uh, then there is the creation of a game uh, for anxiety and cravings in which people through three activities, uh, mindfulness activities uh, based on some research by a doctor in UCLA called Dan Siegel, um, called the Wheel of Awareness, they can utilize these three activities to release anxiety when they want to consume the substances. So the prompt of that was what would happen if instead of you reaching out to a dealer or somebody that can give you access to the substance, in that moment of craving, you have another tool that helps you just release the anxiety. And the last part is a series of community activities and community uh, um, activations. And possibly it's something, it's a dream, but we hope that in the future, we're able to build a garden in your city where people can grow their own veggies and they can be in community, substance users can be in community without the stigma of having to present or some, some sort of, um, I don't know, test the proof that they're not utilizing, but rather thinking about how substance users by themselves can create some sort of uh, autonomy in their own recovery in a safe space. Oh, Janet, you're muted. Sorry, you were a just, professional podcaster. Look, oh my gosh, my brain is a whole nother world right now. <laughs> it's like another brain opens up when you become a mom, seriously. So I'm balancing it out. I'm wondering, First of all, there are a lot of questions that I have in regards to House of Dust, but I guess the first one after describing the work, how did you come up with the name House of Dust? Where did that come from? Mm. And the spelling too, can you, can you confirm that as well? Yeah. Yeah, so it is spelled H-A-U-S. There's so many things for me with that name. So the, the way that this project started, um, trigger warning first. Um, so the way that this project started was I, when I was consuming a lot of substances, uh, my substance of preference at that time was meth. I used to go to the Hudson River and I would just write poems. And one day I write this poem that was about thinking that one day nature was going to take over the city and I was going to fly away in the galactic spatial hammock and like life was going to be beautiful and wonderful. That same night I had an overdose and I ended up in the, in the hospital in a coma for five days. And when I woke up, I, I didn't know if I, if the programs and the, and the programs that I was going through, because I was going to an outpatient program and the therapy that I was having was actually helping me. So I decided that I wanted to understand how to utilize it through art, try to see if art could help me um, heal. And in that process, I ended up writing a play that's called Dust Vanishes Away as a God Seed Spread. It's a really long name. And the, 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 the idea of the dust is because we are all particles of dust. And in reality, the universe itself is just compounds of dust. Uh, and I think it was a way for me to think, to, to, to try to convey and reconnect with what was essential, with what I would think is the most essential thing, which is the universe itself inside of me. And then on the other side, thinking about the similar, similarities that all of us have, which is the humbling part of accepting that at the end, our bodies, our physical bodies are just us. So we have this really big name and we are about to do the play and then the pandemic happens. And when the pandemic happens, we had a very small residence in a place called Loisaira that was for developmental purposes. But the pandemic happens we're like, we're not able to do a play and the play has 12 characters. So what do we do with this? And at that time, Loisaira was thinking a lot about uh, technology and how to implement technology. And I had been toying a, a, a lot with like virtual reality and a lot of projections in space and media installations. I also do film. Um, and we decided that we wanted to find a way of making it into a media installation. So once it becomes a media installation, we're like, we don't want to call it like that because it's not the play. And there are these other two things that are also part of the project. After a lot of conversations with community, uh, with different organizations, other things that I'm sure that I will mention very soon with another question. Um, 
but then then we're like this there are these three different components of the project we know that does stays what is another thing that can help us put it all together and then the idea of a house came in as a house is thinking this is a big house that hosts all of these things and it's also a place of safety and security but then in one conversation with the person who was working in marketing at the time chris and also um she was like why don't we call it a house like voguing like it's a house and we're, we're like yes this is really on brand so it's a house and it's like like that now thinking back in my past one of the clubs that i used to frequent the most in bogota in colombia was called house just like that so it's really interesting to think how things also connect um i think we wanted to, to truly make an, an anthem to to talk about queer um the queer history of new york city and then also think about a home together i love your website and it, at first when i first went to it i was like what is this and for me i like that when i like don't know what it is when it's not so obvious right and i know for some people that can be a little bit tricky because <laughs> they're they need to understand it they need to get it right away but that's the other reason why i loved many of the videos also on your personal website it was you know at times very abstract and more about just the feeling of it and less about like a abc kind of structured story so I love that about your work and I appreciate that. I'm very thankful for that because it's very refreshing right now in this climate. <laughs> but yeah, I think that on your website, you do really well to, to break down the different things that it is and the garden aspect I was very interested in because to me that felt like, okay, now the art is really becoming activism. And I'm also interested in the idea of like a house and then a, a garden, but I just want to give you a chance maybe to elaborate a little bit more on what your strategies are and your, and your goals too, of course, for like, as you said, in your, in your mission statement, how to make sure that you're doing more than just representing something in your art. You're really trying to make a difference in the world. So can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I would like to start by telling you the story of how I ended up working on community engagement. Um, I'm a storyteller. Uh, I was an actor first. Um, when I came to, to New York, I tried to act for a very long time. And the last audition that I had, I was told that I was too white to play Latino. And I was really mad. Yes, I really like to say- I just want to turn my mic on because what? I need the people to know our reactions. Janet just made the same face. Yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. Uh, <laughs> that's ridiculous. I, I think it's uh, I, I, it, it just doesn't make any sense because it really shows how ignorant people are because I have the same situation that happens within my community, community of African-Americans, Black people, when, oh, you're not dark enough. What? I don't understand. That doesn't make any sense. So, it's okay, true. just... No, and then I came back to New York after the audition because it was a big audition and I come back to New York and I'm like, I'm tired of this. I want to figure out a way if I can do my own work. I ended up directing a small show that went really bad for a while. Every time that I would try to direct a show, there would be a snowstorm. It was like a thing. It was like my curse. But that day I was like, I really want to direct theater. And going into that path, I ended up educating, doing doing a lot of education and and utilizing theater as English uh, as a second language to teach people how to utilize, uh, to, to speak English. And then I just started to feel really noisy and eerie with the, uh, the paradigms inside of the hierarchies that have the theater industry at large in New York City. Um, and not only that, but just the idea that I, this, is the, this is how I really feel about this. It's the idea that people think that they're doing something for the world because they're expressing and presenting stories, but at the end, those stories are only represented for their own little social circles. And they don't really end up having any type of impact or, or, or connection to the community itself. And I get a fellowship with something called the Drama League, and it was their first fellowship uh, for public works, which is a program created by the public theater. And they sent me to Dallas. Uh, to be associate director of a show at Dallas Theater Center. 
and I'm there doing as you like it. Uh, and I start to see a lot of things that I don't think I'm okay with when thinking about community work. There was a personal matter that happened there and I was fired for pointing out something that uh, the director was doing that was very racist on my side. They, they were gonna cast a black man as the bad duke in a story where he was like a Napoleon. And then there was a paid actor who was a white man as a hippie. And by the end of the story, the bad duke has to come and search for redemption. And I just kept, I just kept on saying, if you do this, this is just gonna perpetuate to small theaters to think that it's okay to cast a black man as an angry person that looks for redemption. And on the other side, this is a community member who's not getting paid to do this, while the other actor is an equity actor who's getting paid good money to do this. Didn't go through, I was fired, but I left the space looking at, uh, at the person who was my boss at the moment. And I told him, I'm gonna prove to you that there's a better way of doing community engagement. And after that, I stopped doing uh, theater for like a year and something. And I started to work with uh, organizations that work with visual arts and that think about how to really utilize uh, community practice as the foundation of everything, which in the journey, I learned that the word is placemaking um, in the three different of how art is created in difference from studio, which is basing the artist, there is a uh, social practice, which is activist and a lot of times comes inside of this, but I was really interested in the intersection between the activism and placemaking, how me as an artist, I can just utilize myself for whatever the community needs. With my own personal um, approach to it, which is that I don't like to work with communities that I know that I don't have any type of real con life connection with. Um, um, whether it's something social or economical or of journey of, of identity, I like to make sure that I am part first of those communities to make sure that I am actually serving them. So the idea that thinking about how to destigmatize substance use and how to me connect with others and actually come out honest and to everybody say, hey, I have a substance use disorder. And this is actually happening to my family, to my friends, to everybody that I work with. Um, I could create space for community. When I start to talk with different organizations, there was an organization that's in Washington. It's a big organization. It's called the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And I reach out to the president of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, not thinking that she was gonna to reply to me, but she replied to me and I started to learn a lot from them that the way that uh, public funding is given to organizations that are helping with substance use is very defined and, and it has to be in, inside of certain metrics that by itself does not allow for a lot of research to happen um, or a lot of art base or creativity base uh, outlets or outputs that actually can get funding to provide services. So coming from this, I was like, wait a minute, if this is not happening, but it's also, it's also like clear that what they have is not actually working for a lot of people and it's not working for communities that are not white, it's not working for the black community, it's not working for the Latino communities. So not, not thinking about the work as activists, thinking about the work as activation as opposed to activism inside of the community through the game and through the garden. I think the garden is the goal of actually creating a community space. The game is, is a tool given so that the community can decide what to do with it. And then in myself, the activation is the media installation because with all honesty, the media installation was more about my own process of learning how to heal through the own words that I was saying and thinking and hoping that that itself given to people could also be a journey of healing. Something really particular and interesting about the game, which I think is the middle of this, like if we were actually, think, I'm talking about studio practice and placemaking and social practice. And truly I think that the game is in the middle uh, as a social practice is the idea that we did research for six weeks with the LGBT center with patients who are going through um, an outpatient program. And we gave them the game and they started playing the game and they reported that it was helping them with their substance use disorder. But by the end of the six weeks, they reported that they didn't want to use the game anymore because they had already transferred the skills into their lives. 
So it's really interesting to think about how you give a tool and then it's in the autonomy of the community to decide how that tool grows or not grows or how that informs. And, and I think that's where I am interested in thinking about my work as activism, as something that just comes and activates and creates a catalyst and then the community just grows on itself or decides what to do with it with itself. I have a follow up to that. Um, you were saying the National Institute of Drug policy or drug abuse drug abuse and you're talking about in washington dc yes okay so i'm wondering with the information that you have received since their funding has particular language that prevents one from utilizing art as part of their funding are you trying to utilize this particular this information and statistical empirical data to provide to them so that maybe they can shift talking about activation? Yes, so there's a clarification with what you're asking. They don't have anything that prevents art from getting funding, but the thing is that the, the metrics that are required for people to receive funding from them are too scientific and they do not allow anything else that is not a medical research. These I found complicated because substance use, and this is something that they even have in when they give information, they said it's not just, it's not just a scientific or medical thing, it's something that is connected to behavioral science. And now here, here I'm going into things that I don't really know how to describe, but what I'm trying to say is that it's not something that is just a, a, a medical condition that can be treated inside of medical facilities, but it's something that is also need, needs to be treated inside of the social, our, our social endeavors, our social circles. Um, and by itself, it means that it's constantly changing. The programs that are normally used are what people understand as Narcotic Anonymous and AA, but this is something that has more than a hundred years old at the moment. It's about to be almost a hundred years old and it's based on the idea that at the time people people were going through industrialism and there was a necessity of taking people back into the workforce and if you really look at the way that is described yes a lot of things are beautiful and a lot of it works but it's really based on shame and blame and making sure that people feel shame and blame to come back into society and i think that that with how the world has been globalized and how we are right now in a moment where what people really are trying to do is to reflect upon each other and try to understand how to release that shame, it's not really working because then you end up having or being inside of sobriety circles that once they go outside into the world, there is a really big disconnect. And as they say in, in, in any type of, of rehab, the, the um, antagonism of addiction is connection. Because what we really do when we are becoming addicted is we're trying to connect with something that has been lost or something that we don't know how to put together and we just find something to plug it into. So um, my hopes with the game is that once we complete the game, we have these three activities, but we want to enlarge it and make it into something in which by the end of, of, of the whole journey of the story, people are able to connect together as if it was a network, uh, is that once we are able to finish the game and we have done two or three years of extensive, extensive research, I can send it to the FDA and I can say, here is a creative tool that can prove a creative tool that it's based on behavioral science and is based on utilizing art and is based on mindfulness that can actually serve people not to me on the the tool but to say here is a how do you say this in here it's an example i know there's another word but here's an example of one way that we could be thinking about how to treat with art hoping that in the future if there's enough data um places like nida or government agencies can see the the opportunity of actually providing money uh for more artists and for more people that are not scientists and not just scientists. I, I'm working with the scientists. This is not just in my head without any type of support and framework, but it's the approach of the artists working inside of these intersections that I think can provide new visions for what things can be. 
which just to finalize love that leads me to what I was talking about placemaking um, that I find so fascinating and is that um, I truly believe that if we understood the potential of artists working in other intersections of the economy, we could, we could allow the economy to grow in a way that was more socially responsible to people. Um, and, and I think it's also, it's also like a, a case study, that was the word. It's a case study for that. It's a case study for, it's a case study for not only how to utilize art to deal with substance use, but to utilize artistic expression for complex subjects and things and, and problematics inside of our society that we don't know how to fix. Because artists at the end allow us to just see what others maybe are missing. Yeah, it's <laughs> therapy in the arts is a very exciting thing for me, how that is growing in universities and also how there are more and more departments that are at the intersection of art and medicine and art and science. I love that too, seeing the rise of that. And I feel like there's so much we could talk about. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's just real quick what you're talking about Gabrielle with the with identifying how language within these certain institutions pertaining to funding is structured in a way in which it's not holistic I believe is part of how the society has been designed not taking into account different cultural practices and actually smashing cultural practices that bring into the frame the art um the 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 you know all of the pieces that make up a person and within the united states that's not what it's about like you said the reason why this program was to get people back into the workforce it's about just getting people into this lane so that they can continue to do exactly what needs to be done for them to provide to the society in a way that's economic it's not about about being people and how to love people and build love and build a holistic person. And this is why we're seeing so much damage, so much trauma that continues to be perpetuated because it was never addressed in the proper way in the first place. So I just wanted to say that to follow up to what you said, because I, I believe that's, that is, is indicative of what we see in, 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 in the United States right now. I'm, I'm not sure you know, how it is in Colombia, um, but I, I can definitely speak to, to the U.S. And I, and I do want to say something real quick. As a native Washingtonian, Gabrielle, whenever you're talking about D.C., Washington, D.C., as opposed to Washington, the state, because because that's yeah, another situation yeah. about how D.C. gets misrepresented. But just yeah. wanted to say that real quick. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I was wondering was in in your work, particularly the installation that you did, and I'm wondering, I know that had to be trans, transformational in some way and cathartic for yourself in some way, and also hopefully inspiring other people to open up and be vulnerable in their own ways. And I'm wondering with that, as well as you being in rehab now, I'm wondering do you, if you feel, I don't want this to be a leading question, but I'm wondering if you feel like you're getting better tactics or improving your tactics for overcoming your own personal hurdles, but particularly I'm thinking about burnout. And I'm wondering how, how you personally are preventing burnout or maybe not, <laughs> or if you feel like you're getting better at it or maybe not. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I love the fact that you're realizing the word burnout because I think that's how I felt when I was in New York. And I was trying to escape New York for a while now. Um, I love New York so much. I don't think, no, I would be making a generalization, but I think it's the type of place where very few people that I know are able to heal, not thrive. I think thriving is another thing, but I, but I think the busyness of New York and the, the, the amount of things and stimuli that is happening in New York can be difficult for people to make space for themselves. Um, something very interesting that happened with the media installation is that 
we never plan for it to be a four wall thing that would enclose people. And even after I finished the media installation, I think I was so used to talking about the things that I talk about the media installation by now, personal things, that I didn't understand how heavy it was. And for me, throughout the whole thing, and, and it's visually it's not very heavy, but the language and the things that they're talking about is very heavy. So for me, even at the end, I always found it as a space of stillness and something quiet. Some, some some sort of healing process that was quiet for me and that, that would allow me to in, in close my encapsulate myself. But for people, people would come and everybody took the story as a ghost story. Um, and as a ghost story, because the, the story opens saying that we're about to listen to eight souls that have gone to an open mic in a place between the worlds of the living and the dead, where they serve the last stories to move on to be able to transcend. So it, there's like this idea of like, this is a spiritual thing, but we never plan for it to become a ghost story where people would be like, this is actually weird and phantasmagoric is the word. And a lot of people had that feeling um, from beginning to end, but it was so interesting to see how in the heaviness of it, you would have a lot of people that would come out of the installation with a feeling of like a silence, like a moment of, of peaceful reflection that was not through violence or, or, or the traumas that were in the story, but through some sort of release. And I like to talk about this because you were talking before about how my work is very abstract or, or touches on notions, emotions as opposed to logical things. And I think I do that precisely because of what we were just talking about of, of the boxes that in the United States, and not only the United States, but I think the world at large, now we have to live inside, which isn't really just marketing to make sure that we're buying things. Um, but the moment that we are able to get outside of, not, not get outside maybe because we're not able to get outside, but we're able to identify the boxes and then we're able to go beyond the box and say, what is beyond the box? We are going to find that in reality, all that we do is just have emotions. Because humans are em emotions. We're just emotions and the feelings that come from those emotions. So um, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in those emotions. Saying all of that with my journey of healing and burnout. Um, I am very lucky because I was able to get the resources to come to Colombia and take a moment, three months. I'm going to be here for three months and just work on parts of me that I knew that I was not being able to work on because I was overworking, because I was overthinking, because I was doing so many other things that are required, required so many things that require me inside of society. Um, I think the installation was a second step in reflecting and understanding from outside something of me. And now that I'm actually engaging in a program, I am utilizing all of that that I learned that was inside of my brain. And I am putting it into practice, hoping that once I am back in society, I have the individual resources to live with society. Um, I'm about to sound like a pessimist, but I don't like society. I, I, I really just don't like society. I think that, I think that there are so many, there are so many beautiful things that humans do, but there are so many other things that are just based on the identities or the egos that we think that we can do. And, and I think that the way that we're leading into society, into, into not just human civilization is becoming so disengaged from nature itself that I, I don't know, I have a craving for just to be under a tree eating an apple as opposed to being a city, having lunch or dinner, which is so amazing too, but I think that's, that's where I'm at with my process. Um, and because I'm touching on the privileges that I have um, being in here and being able to be here, I, something that I've been thinking a lot about is also how 
it's in the moments of the most struggle that I've had, in the moments that I've been the most scarce, scarce um, in my own life, in emotional, financial resources, that if at that moment I am able to take a moment to breathe in and separate myself from that, I may be able to gain the skill that otherwise I wouldn't have an opportunity to gain to be able to understand reality. Uh, and I say this for whoever is listening that may, may think um, or, or maybe like, yeah, but I don't have the opportunity of, I don't have the opportunity of flying to another country in another continent and start to think about uh, my healing process like that. I think that maybe taking a second and breathing in and meditating no matter how hard it is, may be able to also engage uh, in starting a notion of how to how to process emotions better, which is what I think is really difficult right now with society. What's also really great, Gabriel, is that you are sharing your tools, and there are other people out there too who are sharing their experiences and their tools as well. And there are more and more free resources for people. It needs to be better, <laughs> but, and I like what you also said about <laughs> just very blatantly, like, I don't like society or we wouldn't be doing this work that the three of us are doing right now, right? If we liked, and I think most people don't like society actually. There's just some people like us who are really trying to change it. Some people who are settling and that they maybe feel powerless. I have two things. First thing okay. is like you said, Danny uh, and Gabrielle, I believe a lot of people don't like society. And I looked up the word society in um, dictionary.com. And I'm just gonna read off three of the definitions. And, and the reason why I believe people don't like society. Why am I nervous? <laughs> it says, okay. So this is the fourth one down. A highly structured system of human organization for large scale community living that normally furnishes protection, continuity, security, and a national identity for its members. And it gives an American society as an example. So that's funny. Then number five, <laughs> fifth way down, such a system characterized by its dominant economic class or form. Hmm, I wonder why people wouldn't like society if the dominant economic class or form is, is, is how it's characterized. And then this number six definition down, <laughs> those with whom one has companionship. That right there is interesting to me as to why one wouldn't like society because you're, let's say, for example, again, I'm speaking from the American experience, the American, the United States society. It's, I don't feel at home here. I have family and friends, but, and who I have as companions, but as a whole, I don't feel the companionship as an American for American society. So just thinking about the reasons why uh, people wouldn't like society, because I totally, totally, completely understand and empathize with, with that feeling. Um, I think it's I'm worth like. acknowledging too that Janet, you have lived in places abroad as well as, oh, as yeah. I have as Gabrielle. <laughs> yes. So like I think that's a very valid, very that's valid true. statement. <laughs> that's important to recognize that we have definitely and continue to live in different places, in different societies, right? Different mm -hmm. cultures. Um one of the other things that I would like to ask, because I like you said, we I know and we have to wrap up. Um, and I think it'll be uh Second to last question, because we have a group question that we're going to ask you, Gabrielle. But um, this question is sort of, I think, uh, for me, it's like a fun question and, and something that maybe people would be interested in. You listed uh, South American plants mm -hmm. as part of the work. So I'm curious, what are these plants and what is the significance of those plants? And because yeah. and, I think about plants as healing, too. So that's another reason why I'm bringing it up. So, um... I, I'm about to say something really contradictory as well, but I don't think, I don't think it's the substance issue. I think it's the people's relationship with those substances. And to me, substances are spiritual mediums. 
I think their spirits, uh, I think they connect us with other parts of our dimensions, of our brains, of, of the dimensions that we can exist inside. Um, in Colombia, there are three, I don't know how you say this in English, but it's uh, a group of mountains. When, when there's many mountains that go together, we call it cordilleras. But Colombia being the first country in South America, Colombia has three cordilleras, it's called the Andes. And these three places are what is called, it's like the spine of the three continents, actually. If the cordilleras, for some reason, there's an earthquake or something from North America all the way down, it would just break. Uh, they help hold everything. Um, and in these uh, mountains, there used to be, there are still people, but there were uh, ethnic groups, the Andean people or the people from the Andes. And they're very well known because they would use the coca leaf uh, as something for healing practices. And they would see the coca leaf as a sacred uh, plant. Um, so throughout the story, well, the story is divided into two parts. The second part is where I talk about my own personal journey. And I place myself as a little boy who's trying to imagine characters. But in the first part of the, of the show, we meet these characters, which are the eight souls that are talking in the abysm, which is this part. And two of these souls, one of them talks about the journey of the coca leaf all the way from South America, turn into dust, one type of dust, which is cocaine, and then given to Dominican Republic to then be spread all throughout the world. Um, and then another one, um, which is the character is called Pachamama, which is the goddess of the earth in South America in many cultures. She talks a lot about the connection between amapolas, which are poppy seeds, and how they're turned into something called escopolamina, which in Colombia is used to control people to like kidnap them or stuff. They do this powder that if people inhale it, whatever other people tell them to do, you would do it. Um, so I think it, it, I, in the in the show I talk a lot I talk about these plans and a couple of their plans as talking about how nature itself can be corrupted by our acts and at the end it's not about it's not about it's not about the the high the going into another dimensions but it's the toxicity of how the plants have been turned for that purpose itself and as well the healing practices and the healing abilities of these plants because um, they, they're, they're healing and they're not just healing physically, but they're healing spiritually. They, there's a reason why in Colombia, we, they, we do yaje, which is our version of ayahuasca. There's a reason why there are these practices of going into another dimensions and activating our brain and allowing our brain to deal with things that normally we're not able to put in the in the consciousness, but they're in the subconscious. The story I talk about, the, the, the struggles that I've had with substances and how they have deteriorated me, burned me out in many ways. Uh, but I also talk about the, the opportunities spiritually that, I that I've had through the plans and through those journeys to learn and understand parts of myself that I still think otherwise I wouldn't have understood. That was great. That was yeah, great. That, yeah. <laughs> just, just just listening, just just taking it all in, Gabrielle, Danny. That was great. Yeah, I'm feeling inspired. How about you, Janet? <laughs> I'm I, you know, I'm in the forest right now, and I just and it's just like <laughs> needed to just reflecting on what Gabrielle is saying. I'm I'm feeling um, I'm definitely feeling inspired. You know, just helping me understand for myself just what I'm looking to do with these next couple of works I have lined up. So thank mm. you, Gabrielle. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that I, I'm the one who has to, to bid everyone to do. So I would- You gotta go to feed a baby. Our, yeah, I would love, you know, it's like, this is, this is how it is, labor, you know, labor. It's labor, right? <laughs> so yeah. um, Danny, if you want to, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> ask the question, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's my favorite. Thank you. Yeah. So you were talking about how you don't like society, right? So going back to that, 
This is our final question we ask all of our guests. Okay, okay ready? One. On three? Yeah, on three. On three. three. So the number three <laughs> on it. One, two, three. Okay, there we go. Okay, excellent. So now that we've got that done, <laughs> now, now we can ask the question. <laughs> all right, so Gabriel, in your utopia, there would be <laughs> in my utopia there will be lots of trees a river a river where everybody can swim there would be people who wouldn't be afraid of death but more afraid of not living. There will be a lots of smiles and community. I want to say something, but it is is not framed on the whole on the on the on the on the way of the question. Say Can it. I, yeah. I don't like society, but I love community. Mm. And what is community? Can you say real quick what is community to you? To me, uh, community to me it's buenas. It's what's happening right now, apparently. <laughs> community to me it's a group of people. Um, community to me is humans being able to be themselves, working together towards a common goal community to me is community to me is a place that functions towards a purpose where everybody feels that they can fulfill their identity and what they came into the world to do as in difference with society because i think inside of society people have to feel inside of what society means as opposed to them being able to be themselves mm -hmm. working together i mm -hmm. i always use the i always talk about how if we would if we were all to live in a society that didn't have so much technology how maybe i am the one who's really good at bringing water and maybe in reality there's somebody else who's really good at organizing people together uh, and somebody else is really good at planting seeds. And it's the idea that we're all able to achieve something that feels greater for ourselves and for who we can be and what we know that we can do, but we all go towards a common goal. Um, yeah. I, when I think about activism, when I think about activism, I think about a lot, a lot about community because it's always so, I think, I think when things come from need, even though ego can be attached to that, the ego is way lower than, than in other places where the need is just privilege. And those communities that are the start from need tend to grow into places of creating functions for themselves. I think that's a beautiful way to conclude Thank today's you. podcast episode. Thank you before, so before, much, Gabriel. Before, before, before you finish, before you finish, I just want to say, in my what was the word the the, the question utopia in my utopia. utopia there will also be unicorns <laughs> yes we have unicorns yes. behind us on the screen not literal yes. actual unicorns but you know the <laughs> silhouette so yes <laughs> yes Gabrielle, sparkly, thank you. sparkly like university looking dust yes. they're full of purple, dust purple and, purple and blues yes it's, it's wonderful yes. so <laughs> And unicorns to... aren't afraid of death either. <laughs> so. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do keep us posted um, just on your happenings. And yeah, uh, actually, where can people learn about your happenings yeah. or just what you're doing? And I know maybe right now you're not posting a lot, but I'm of the grid, but Gabriel G. Torres is is my Instagram um, and in my website, if you go at the bottom, there is a section where you can sign up to my newsletter. Um, awesome. I am doing uh, an activation with University Settlement in 
Brooklyn at the end of the year. And I don't know what else is happening. Um, okay. How's it those will continue? There's a lot of other things happening. Mm -hmm. If you also want to find out about it, just go to iamdoes.org and you can sign up to the newsletter. And if there's new community activities, we are maybe going to have an exhibition next year with what the community created, as well as receive information about the game and when it may be available for people to just download it and mm -hmm. play with it. You can just go there. Thanks for tuning in to Reflect Recalibrate. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way we know that you love us. But for real, that way you always know when to reflect, recalibrate. Also, don't forget to look in the notes to this episode for information on the apparel that we're wearing, the resources that we give in the episode, as well as a PayPal link in case you decide to send us some love. It's always super duper appreciated. The more love that we can get, then the more resources we're able to provide you all. Thanks again.